Now we shift gear to the next phase, and that is unholy living among us. Unholy living among us. Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 32. Unholy living among us. Unholy living among us. I don't know about you. I don't know how I'm one of those I hate late with capital letters. I hate late. I don't like late. I hate it. The word hate, late, I hate it. I don't like it. If I have an appointment with you, you better be on time. If you're not on time, the first one, the second one, I may not have an appointment with you, the third one. That's just me. Don't like late. And as Christians, we shouldn't be late, by the way. It's part of your expression of your integrity. Because if you start, if you are, if you are, if you, if you are a man of integrity, a woman of integrity, if you start sliding in one way and it's not being truthful, that's another way of not being truthful and you don't know it. I'm going to be there at seven, you're not. You're there at eight. You lie, you better confess, God, I told him I would be there at seven. I didn't get, Father, forgive me for that sin. You, shouldn't, you should confess it, by the way. I don't like it, period. And especially when I was in school, I don't like going to class late. If I'm late in class, I better I just might as well not go into the class. Because I don't like when I walk into the classroom, I will see a, a professor's drawing, and then I, all I see is the, I don't see the head, because the head has already been erased. I see the body, and I don't know how the head is connected to the body. I'm just lost for the whole day. And the professor will be talking and talking and talking, and tell you, he will tell you, remember what the head, I, I didn't remember because I wasn't there. I didn't know what you're talking about. So you see how that head connected to the neck, back neck, and the, I don't know, I didn't see it. I wasn't there when you said it. I'm lost. I don't know about you. Same way, in everything that you do, whether it's a church or not, you shouldn't be, the lead should be removed from your vocabulary. It should be a believer that puts your, your word should be your bond. So I don't like late. I told my daughter all the time, I don't like late. And, and she would tell me, we go to class, I'll pick her to school. She said, Dad, it takes 10 minutes to go to school. I said, yeah, it's, we are living at 20. Yes, it's, but it's still 10 more minutes. I said, no, it's not. But he said, it takes 10 minutes. I said, yeah, it takes 10 minutes. But you should add 10 minutes extra just in case there is traffic or an accident. And uh, occasionally, we will get to the, where there's accident. And, and that 10 minutes is used. I said, I told you. I like on time. It, it's, it, it, it makes you, even in a workplace, if you're a person that comes late, forget it. Don't ask for promotion because you wouldn't get anyone. one. Because they already seen you as somebody that uh, you're not trustworthy. You're not reliable. Why am, I getting, why am I saying all these things? I'm saying this because last week when we taught for 15 minutes, people were so frustrated. We had a technical problem last week. People were frustrated on the Facebook all over the world. They can see me, but they can't hear me. They can see what I'm doing, but they can't hear my voice, no audio because of technical issue for 15 minutes. So they were so frustrated, they, they turn off, they thought it was their problem, they turn off, they turn it back, they reboot they, for 15 minutes until, uh, our brother Perry sent them a technical problem, hang on. They, they waited, many of them waited. And some said, please, can you re repeat the message? The first, they said that it's a New Year message, the first message of the New Year. Unholy living. Like I said, we come to one of the dreadful passages of our uh, text in the book of Romans. 
This chapter is one of the dreadful chapters of this teaching of this great book. And uh, being dreadful, one of the one of the great uh, oracle of uh, Bible uh, teachers, uh, Charles Spurgeon says something that very interesting when he too went through the book of Romans. He said that this book is a book that you shouldn't really read aloud in the, in the public place. It's not something you read. It's something that you read in, probably in your private place. But he, he himself, because he's, he's a teacher, he has to read it. But this is what he, what he said. I quote him, this first chapter of the epistle to the Romans is a dreadful portion of the word of God. I should hardly like to read it all through aloud. It is not intended to be so used. Read it at home and be startled at the awful vices of the Gentile world. End of quote. And that was from Charles Spurgeon. See, when Paul wrote to the Romans, when Paul wrote to the Romans, Romans, the people of Rome, they were at the peak of what you may call uh, just living a life of carelessness. They were at the peak of living a life of carelessness. And when Paul wrote to this uh, Roman Empire, he was writing from Corinth. And Corinth, too, was not better, except that perhaps Rome was the worst, because it was the capital city of the world. Corinth, like I told us last uh, week, Corinth was a, a sin city. Was, you can call it a sin city. If you want to, if you want to enjoy sin, go to Corinth. No limitation, no, no restriction uh, in Corinth. In fact, they had a temple. They had a temple that was housing 1,000 prostitutions as a form of worship. As a form of worship. That's the women will, 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 they will wear, they will have, they will trim or cut their hair and they will have bald hair. And that's how you recognize the women. And that's why when these women, after they were converted, they came to church with bald hair. And, and the question came up. What, how do we, what will we do with these men? That's when Paul told them to cover their hair. It's not something for the whole church, uh, cover your hair everywhere. No, 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 no. It's specifically for the current because of the, the nature of that community at the time when the Bible was written. And that's why people, you just read the Bible and say, cover your hair. You say, okay, women cover your hair, cover, but you don't know the context. You don't know what prompted Paul Paul didn't write to the Ephesians, cover your hair. He didn't write to the Colossians, cover your hair. He didn't, only the current, because of the, remember, uh, current, current, uh, in, in current, Paul, what he saw caused him to, he wanted to just leave. He said, this is a horrible place to, to even minister. <laughs> Paul, you came to minister the gospel. Where you want, why do you want to go? Sydney, Australia, where there is no problem. Some missionaries like to go to Australia. No, Australia is a little bit difficult. They want to go to Hawaii. Some missionaries want to go to Hawaii. Why don't you send me to Hawaii? Send me to Cayman Islands. Send me to those places. There is no problem. I can, I can be, in fact, send me to the beach. There are unbelievers at the beach. I want to go to the beach and preach to them, share them the gospel. As I share to them, I also lay, lay my back on the sign. That's the missionary work. I like that kind of missionary work. Nobody wants to go to the dangerous places. Friends have told me, I would like to go on to mission, but I wouldn't like to go to that place you are going. Really? Mission on a box. Nah. Paul was so frightened when he saw what was happening in the current, and he said, I'm, getting, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, I'm getting out of this place. The Lord came to him that night and said, Paul, I knew what you were thinking. I'm not telling you, don't go anywhere, don't leave. Stay here. But I'm guaranteeing you, nobody will harm you, nobody will touch you. 
I am with you. And Paul stayed. That's Paul. And so when he wrote to Romans, Romans was a city. Like I, I mentioned, it's a city where you can go and have fun. <laughs> I, I, I say fun, fun, fun. I like, I have heard that my ears are ringing because I've heard that word too many times. Fun, 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 fun. What's fun? If I ask you to define fun, can you define fun? Fun. We want to have fun. You think that fun is something that thinkers see and thinkers see is fun. Fun. Uh, and let me, let me put this here. Anything that you are doing, any activity you are participating that will lead you away from the Lord is not fun at all. Fun that does not glorify God is funny, funny, funny. So Rome, Rome was the capital city or capital foreign city of the world when Paul wrote. So this section, I did the, uh, divided this section into two parts. Into two parts. We're going to look at this awful section. Let me put it that way. That's this dreadful section that the Apostle Paul wrote. It wasn't an easy thing for him to write. We are going to look at this section into two parts. I, I see one thing I, I, I tell people all this thing all the time. It is not, a, we, this church, I have heard it said in many places, I've heard people say that this church is a unique church. There was a person that told me that he, he has searched or looked, he, he, there is no church he can compare with this church in the state of Tennessee. I'm not here to argue. I'm not here to, to, to compare myself with that church or that church. Or com- That's not my business. But I'm here to tell you, it is not about the quality of the truth that you are receiving. It's, it's good you receive sound teaching. That's why the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 2, desire the sincere, the undiluted milk of the word of God that you may grow thereby. If you are not taking sound, if you are not taking uh, pure milk, you will be sick. That's for sure. And that's what characterizes many churches today, sickness. They are packed, they are sick. You see mega churches, but they are sick. How do we know they are sick? Because there is no substance in them. When problem hit, they fall flat immediately. It is not uh, the quality. You must look for the quality. Make sure that what you are eating is healthy. Otherwise, you're going to be sick. That's why you say don't eat junk food. <coughs> junk food will make you sick. If you eat too much junk food, you're going to be sick. The same way when you are taking in the word of God, Jeremiah said, your word was found. He didn't just see everything he picked, that's the word. He said, was found, that means he was searching for the word. And I did it. It is a metaphor for taking in the word of God to the point that it becomes useful to him as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, let's, don't just be like, James said in James chapter 1, a hearer of the word doesn't do you any good. But a doer. Make that a point of duty in your spiritual life. I was speaking to one of my bosom friends or close friends yesterday. I was just telling him that I have, what I have seen among Christians today is that many know the truth, but the application is disconnected. So what, 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 how can you, are you, you cannot be, you cannot be different from an, an unbeliever that you are ministering to if your life has no demarcation. Your life must show. You see, if a person is eating sound, if a person is eating healthy, the, the body will show. You look at the person and say, you look healthy. But when a person is sick, you know. That's, what did you eat? Why, why are you having diarrhea? What did you eat last night? You go, you're having a lot of diarrhea this morning. Maybe you ate uh, meat that was uh, tainted. Maybe you, you ate something that, what, 
garbage in. You can say garbage in, garbage out. What goes in comes out. And so be a believer that when you hear the word, first let this word do some work in you. That is the first thing a Christian should do. Take that thing you are hearing. Don't, 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 do, don't, have, don't form the habit of whenever you hear a teaching, you start thinking of somebody else. I wish this person were here. I wish, how can I, maybe after I finish teaching, the first thing you do is you forward it to the person. You need to hear, you need to listen to this message. So this message is for this person, but it's not for you. No, first is for you. Whenever you hear any message, think of yourself first before you think about another person. And, and that's what uh, Ezra, Ezra, a great teacher. Ezra was called to lead the people of Israel back to the Lord. And he, he, the first thing he did, he grabbed the law and locked himself up in Ezra chapter 7. That was the first thing he did. He wasn't, he, wasn't an anxious, he wasn't anxious to start telling the people, let's get back to the law. Let's get back to the law. Turn to the law. The Lord, that's our problem in our society. Let's, he, didn't, he, wanted, he took time. I don't know how, many, how much time he took, but he took time. He said in Ezra 7.10, Ezra did three things. He studied the law. He didn't just read it. He studied it to see how they were connected, beginning from the five Torah, the five books of Moses. He went through and saw how all these things had and what failure can result when we abandon the world. He saw them all and what God can do to us when we abandon his world. As he stayed there and looked between him and the world and he allowed this world to change his own life, to impact his life. In the presence of God, he took a decision never to go back to that old life. Having been prepared, he now stepped forward to share the truth to other people. People who knew him, as he shared the truth, they look at his life and see that Ezra is in that same person we see now. That is the essence of the word of God. Let it change you. Don't open your mouth to preach to anyone until the word that you have received have changed you. I hate being around, around people who tell what the Bible says, but it's not reflecting in their life. I don't like to be, they, they say, that's, Jesus himself called them hypocrites. I don't like being around a hypocrite. If you are my friend, the moment I discover you are a hypocrite, I drop you like a bomb. I'm serious. I don't, I don't, I only have a handful of friends. You can count it in my fingers. I'm not a person, I'm not, I, the whole world, I, they are my friends, by the way, but only very few. Because I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm very picky. I'm a picky person. I'm a picky in what I eat. Picky. My, my, my daughter gives me that where I say, Dad, can't you change? Can't you try something new? I say, No, I don't have time for something new. I, say, I don't want to be disappointed. <laughs> I don't want to be disappointed in food. So if I only, if I only know rice stew and rice stew, that's what I go. If I go to any freeway in the world, to the point that if I go to a restaurant, fish? Yes, yeah, you know me, fish. Fish? I remember when I, when I, many years ago, when I was uh, in our office in down off Frisboro Road, I would go for lunch to McDonald's. It's just by our office. Every time I go to, they say, what do you want? Fish combo. French fries and fish. No sauce. Remove the sauce. So they have, uh, they have given me fish combo all the time that whenever I step forward and step dead, they already got it ready. It's fish combo. I say, yep, you got it. Why try McD, T, L, and McD? I don't want all those things. I'm safe with fish. That's how picky I am. Now, in our study, Romans chapter 1, 
verse 21. Paul now writes to these people, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him or glorify him literally as God or give thanks, but they became fertile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. As one, prophet, as one Bible teacher said, it is unthinkable for one to not show gratitude for those who have been his or her benefactors. There are people in your life, there are people who have played a role in your life to bring you where you are. The worst thing that can say of you is that you are not grateful to those people that <coughs> made you who you are in life. And this author says, this uh, Bible teacher said, it's even unthinkable that you cannot recognize the creator God who made you who you are from the beginning. And that's what Paul is saying here. Even though they knew this creator, but they became fertile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the loss of their hearts to impurity that their bodies might be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions for their women exchanged their natural function. You mark that word, natural function. So anything contrary is no longer natural. Natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, in also the men abandoned the natural function of the women and bond in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the penalty of their, you mark the word, error. Error. That's what Paul says, error. Paul is describing homosexuality. He said, error. I don't care what the state says. I don't care what psychology says. My Bible that I stand says, error. I didn't write it last night. I just read it. If you want to argue with me, don't argue with me. Argue with the Bible. It says, error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, error, proper, improper. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, Boastful, invent, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and though they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. They not only do them, they sign on for those who practice them. And Paul was writing, as, as Paul was writing through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, through the, the uh, mentorship of the Holy Spirit, he projected his eyes under this as he sees what was going on in the, in the uh, Roman Empire, the, as, as the, uh, the capital of the world, Rome itself. He saw, he knew the condition of these people. Immorality has gone 
of the roof when Paul was writing. Uh, homosexual lifestyle was rampant as well. Even emperors, some emperors were involved in, in, in this lifestyle. So when he was writing to the people, he knew what he was writing about. They knew what the truth was, but they, su they, they suppressed the truth, as we saw in verse 20. They suppressed what they knew. That you suppress the truth doesn't mean it's not the truth. That you're sitting on top of truth doesn't mean it's not the truth. They knew the truth, but they suppressed it. No one, no person born on this planet or that doesn't know the truth about the existence of God. He just suppressed it in unrighteousness and said, no, it doesn't exist. It does not hear. It's not true. It's not true. But inside of them, they knew that something is more superior than what they are saying. So, in our study, I divided this into two. One, part one, the origin of unholy living. The origin of unholy living, part one. To some of you, it's a, a little bit of a review. With the, with the new addition, whatever the Holy Spirit is telling you, he didn't tell you last week, I'm sure. That's his, that's his job. The way he's challenging you today, I'm sure he didn't challenge you last week. That's his job. My job is just to stand and let him speak. That's, all, that's my job. My job as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is to stand and let the Holy Spirit do his work. On the origin of unholy living, part one. Part two, the consequences of unholy living. So let's begin with the part one, the, first, the part one. The origin of unholy living, even as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ today. Are you living an immoral life? Are you living in sin? How do, how do, how do you get there? But, but even though we are concentrating as unbelievers, because when Paul was written, he was addressing the condition of unbelievers, the hidden. He was addressing said, a, a, a hidden night is in that state, not because God made him to be in that state. He's in that state because God has shown him truth, he suppressed it. Instead of digging for more to find out more truth, he said, no, I'm not going any further. It's not, it's, I, don't, I, can't, I can't believe what, I, what is, my soul is telling me. This is, this is something, there is something more than what you are saying. No, 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 I don't. My soul, forget it, forget it. No, no, it doesn't exist. That's what the Paul is saying in verse 20, they suppress. So we want to know, where does this originate? Where does this originate? What is the origin of this unholy living? Since God is not the author of unholy living, where, did, where, does, it, where does it originate? I propose three answers. One, when people refuse to acknowledge God's revelation of himself through general Revelation, Romans 1.21, even though they knew God, they didn't acknowledge. When people refuse to acknowledge God's revelation of himself through general revelation, Romans 1.21, they are walking on the slippery rope of unholy living. Two, when people engage in the worship of creatures, rather than than the creator God. When people engage in the worship of creatures, you are walking toward unholy living, even if you are a believer. When you begin to worship creatures, we, every time we hear the, the idea of worshiping creatures, we always think of worshiping creatures as, oh, I'm not in India. Where you go to India, you see every type of God erected and all those structures. No. You can worship, as, as Jeremiah said, the idol of the heart. The idol of the heart. 
There is idol in the heart. You know that? The idol of the heart. You may worship your job. Your job can be an idol. Your school can be an idol if you're a student. Or even if you're married, now the, the, the two-legged person in your house can be an idol. The two-legged person in your house can be an idol. Your wife or your husband. How do you know an idol? How do we know if, I have, if I'm worshiping an idol? Let me, let me give you the simplest answer. Anything you put above God is an idol. That, that's not difficult to, to, to find out. You can ask yourself, is there anything that I placed above God? If, you, if there is. If going to party will rob you, your fellowship with God, <laughs> you, are, you are engaging in idolatry and they don't even know it. You can rationalize it. You can say, well, uh, it's something I do every now and then. You can do all your rationalization you can you want. You are entering into idol worship. Anything you place that takes precedent over your relationship with God is idolatry. Somebody said Christianity is, Christian living is hard. No, it is not hard. It's difficult. It's impossible. So what do you mean? I mean that it is not something you can live by your own strength and power. It can only be lived by the power of God. Jesus said, take my own yoke. It's so simple. That yoke can only be brought about by the Holy Spirit who indwells us. If you allow him to live, the, to live out the life of Christ in you, you see it's so simple. We are struggling and failing because we are trying to do it, do it your own self, kid. So it doesn't work that way. Three, when God gives people over to the loss of their hearts, when holy living starts when God gives people over to the loss of their hearts. Romans 1, 24, 26, 28, where we read, we, we, we keep say, saying, God gave them over. God gave them over. My friend, I cannot say that enough. Don't come to a point in your life when God will give you over to the point that you no longer return. It's dangerous. You keep hearing me. Even, even I stand here and teach you the truth, and you hear the truth, and you keep sitting and pushing it up, pushing it up, pushing it up, pushing it up. Pushing it up. There comes a time that too, much, too many pushing up, pushing up, pushing up, pushing up. God said, okay, I'm done. My friend, you are gone. Uh, you, 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 when you get to that point, you are marching to what John says. Don't pray for this individual in 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. You are heading toward sin unto death. God will remove you from this life. Any means, accident, anywhere, heart attack, he will just remove you from this world. And he'll bring you home. By the way, when he removes you, you're not going anywhere. You're going to home. Why are you going home? Because you're going home not because of your work, good or bad. You're going home because he has saved you by grace. Second Timothy 1.9, he saved you not because of your works. But you're going home empty-handed. You're not only going home, but you're entering, you're bordering the early departure. Early, early, early flight. I call it early flight. I don't like early flight. I'm a traveler. And I know what I mean when I say early flight. Sometimes my flight is three in the morning, four in the morning, when I should be sleeping. I just finished my program last night. And sometimes I say, well, well it doesn't, I don't have to sleep. I might as well stay awake and take a shower and then head to the airport. That's what we call it early departure. There is early departure for believers. That means those who are not fulfilling the plan that God has given to them. There is early departure, getting ready to, be, to take off. As a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, don't be part of early departure. 
When you arrive in the early departure flight, there is no homecoming welcoming in heaven. Jesus will not stand like he stood for Stephen. When Stephen was stoned, Jesus stood for the first time in ovation, standing ovation for the servant that is coming. Or there will be no beckoning of angels like when Lazarus died. There were convoy of angels who took him home. You just arrived. Nobody knows that you haven't even arrived. You arrived naked. Nobody wants to look to a naked person. It's up to you, but it's real. Early departure. Where we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, for this reason, if I start it, for this reason, many of you are sick, many of you have already died. That means sudden death. Proverbs tells us about sudden death. In verse 59, uh, Proverbs 29, 1, it says, he who is being uh, worn so many times and he stiffened his neck, that person says, suddenly, that person will be cut off without remedy. Avoid this. This is the reason why we have, see, don't you like this our church? Don't you like this church? Don't you love it? I love it because there is no marination. I don't marinate. I don't marinate. I don't put honey on the meat. I don't put any, I don't lace, I don't lace and say this is good. Put your mouth. Juice it. No, no. I give it to you raw. And that's where life is. That's why you are alive. Avoid early departure. So this can be characterized or summarized with three characteristics of human rebellion. One, ignorance, verse 21. Two, idolatry, verse 23. Three, impurity, verse 24. Ignorance leads to idolatry. And idolatry leads to impurity. If you have been studying the book of Revelation with us, you will know that Babylon played a role in what we say, or what we call the, uh, Babylon played a, a role in saturating the world with idolatry. Babylon played a role in saturating the world with idolatry. Babylon was a place Babylon was a place Babylon was a place where immoral or immorality and idolatry began but Babylon was a place where immorality or idolatry Idolatry began. In, 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 uh, we, like, again, we know about Nimrod. Again, if you have been studying, uh, if you've been studying uh, the book of Revelation with us, we know about Nimrod. Nimrod, the grandson of, uh, of uh, Ham, the great grandson of Noah, after the destruction of the world in the flood, God mandated in Genesis 9, God told them, go and populate the world. That's a mandate from God. Go and populate the world. This man called Nimrod, as evil as he was, in, this, in fact, his name Nimrod in Hebrew means rebellious one, rebellious one. That's his name. To have a name given you that is not good in the ancient time is not good itself. Nimrod. Don't call your child Nimrod. 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 <coughs> Nimrod. Nimrod be began the Babel, the building of Babel. That's why we got that word Babylon. He was in charge of starting this building that will go straight to heaven so that we don't go anywhere. We have our own quarters here. These are our quarters. Go where? If we can get to God from here, where else do we need to go? 
disobedient. In their disobedience, Nimrod, Nimrod married, she, he married a, a wife. The, the, the wife he married, this wife is said to be uh, people who know uh, scholars and people who go through scriptures say that she was his mother. You say, that's awful. That's evil. He had not, not too much evil <laughs> to the point that it's happening even now. There was a case in Zimbabwe where a mother married her son. It's happening. He said, he said that we are in love. Huh? Love. Wow. Welcome to Nimrod world. Nimrod and say me, say me, say, say, eh, 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 this, this, this woman says, uh, Semiramis, that's her name, Semiramis. She was the, you can call her priestess. Uh, priestess, the founder of idolatry. That's her. Semiramis is the, was the founder from the origin. If you want to know where it started, she started it. She said, when her husband died, she said, my husband appeared to me. In the spirit, and I conceived and had a baby, a son called Horus. That's on Holy Trinity. On Holy Trinity. Son, mother, and father. On Holy Trinity. And she deified themselves as. Object of worship. That's how people started worshiping them. In other words, Horus is the Messiah. Genesis 3.15 has been fulfilled in us. And people began to worship them. That's how all this began. And populated to the whole world. Migrated even to Rome. The, the child, the mother holding a child, we see it everywhere now. That uh, uh, monument you see, a mother holding a child, it, it, it is not Jesus and Mary. It started from Babylon. Centuries before Christ was, was even born. Ma Ma Madonna and Son. So this is the story of how evil entered into the world, how idolatry entered into the world. As, so Babylonianism was already infiltrated in Rome when Paul was writing to these people. Well, in a, in. Bear with me. Today is a little bit, uh, since uh, uh, it's a communion day, turn with me to Romans. In Romans, here the Apostle Paul is talking to the people of Rome. In verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his internal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen. No ambiguity being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. They are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him, glorify him. As God for, or give thanks, they, they became fertile in their speculations. They became fertile in their speculations. And they, their foolish heart was darkened. This is important. God did not first darken their heart. It was after. After. A, a, a brother was asking me 
how do we relate? How do we, how can we reconcile? That's a good question. I even, when I, in my studies, I tried to uh, I scratch my head. I said, well, the same passage he used came to my mind when I was, he was doing my study. And that was uh, uh, second Timothy, second Peter 3, verse 9, that God is not willing that anyone should perish. How do you reconcile it with God saying here, God, that in their heart? Uh, uh, well, it's so simple. God gave them time, and they refused to accept the truth. And then God gave them over. That's how God works. God doesn't just come when you are born and he dark in your heart. He will give you time to accept the truth if you refuse. Because he's a God of grace, a God of compassion. That's true. That's how God functions everywhere. Even when he was dealing with the Israelites. If you doubt me, turn, to, turn with me to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles 36. <laughs> I, I, I love the Bible. I love to teach it because it makes me, it, it sets me free from anybody trying to stone, stone me. Because when you, when, you break, when you pick up your stone to stone me, I'll just take you to the scripture. Throw your stone to the scripture. Second Chronicles 36, verse 15. And the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent war to them again. I want you to underline that word. Again and again and again by his messengers. That means repetition. Because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they continually mocked the messengers of God. That's negativism. That's the action of rejection of truth. The action of rejection of the warning from God. The same thing, don't, don't take yourself out of this message. Because as you are hearing my voice, it's not my voice, it's the voice of the Holy Spirit. You say, Moses, I know you, I know your voice. Even when we're talking on the phone, I know it's Moses talking. <laughs> really. <laughs> but they continually mock the messengers of God, despise his words, and scoff as the prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, until there was no remedy. Nothing much to do. The same way is what we are reading in Romans. God will come to a point whereby you are no longer, he will no longer give you that limb way. He cut it off. That's what Paul is saying to them. He gave them over. And once God gives you over, then you, you now have the free way, the broad way. You enter into the broad way, and you can do just about anything. I'm talking about people doing, people doing what, we, what Paul, if Paul, what people are doing today, Paul didn't write them all. There are cases where people are marrying their dogs. You got that? People marrying their dogs. I don't want to be very graphic this morning. But if the spirit moves me to be graphic, I'm going to be graphic. I'm not, it's happening. Google. You can Google about everything. There's anything, anything you want to do in the Google, just Google. You Google everywhere in the world. <laughs> Thanks to Google. <laughs> Why? So Paul said, because they rejected the truth and exchanged the glory of verse 23 and exchanged the, the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. That's sheer and adulterated foolishness. To be following around something you saw, maybe your dog that just gave birth yesterday, it's now your, your God. Wow. And you've been in existence before your dog was born. And it's now the God that you need to worship. That's what you call foolishness, isn't it? Verse 24, therefore, 
Therefore, God gave them over in the loss of their hearts to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. Now, God has finally said, you want foolishness? You are going to see foolishness to the highest level. And people are going to look at you and see your action. People are going to, people, by the way, there are people who are sleeping with animals. That should cause your skin to explode. But it's happening. That's part of foolishness. That's part of God saying, I am releasing you. I have taken my restraint away from you. You are now going to be animal. You want to be animal? You're going to act like animal. So it is not God showing mercy. Rather, it's God giving you over to what you want to be in life. Christianity is not your ordinary, my friend. It's not your ordinary. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we should be very careful what we do and how we do it. But time comes when God will say, I am done. I am done. Don't get to that point. Don't get to that point. John gave a warning and says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. Turn there with me. I keep saying, when I say 1 John, you think it's, it's in another book. 1 John 5, verse 16. So it's good sometimes to read. Read it. It's, sometimes you read it. You don't even know. Wow, I've read these places. I've not seen this one. 1 John 5.16. John was writing to believers, by the way. This passage is for believers, not for unbelievers. And what, what did John say? I hope uh, my memory is, I just quoted from my head. I hope I still, is this correct? He said, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask God and God will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make a request for this. In other words, there's, a, there's one God marked. Maybe it's, it's that sin of continuous disobedience, continuous rejection of his grace. There comes a time when you cross the line. Nobody can pray you out. You are hidden. No matter, people keep telling you, why don't you come to church anymore? You, you, don't, you don't want to do anything. You are, you are marching forward. You are heading toward the exit because you have crossed the line. This is the justice of God. You want the truth? You get the truth at Bethlehem Missionary Church. I give you the truth. I'm not here to scratch your head. I'm not here to rub your back. I'm not here to pick your teeth. No, 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 no. I'm here to give you the truth of the word of God. My Bible says, Jesus himself said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's why we have gathered here. So Paul said, God gave them over. Verse 25, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So, emperor in those days was even worshipped. As we close, I want to close with these six points. One, false religion and idolatry are the acts of man's choice. False religion and idolatry are the act of man's choice. God doesn't make you to do it. You didn't choose, God doesn't force you to choose false religion. Man has that free, God gave it to you because he cannot hold you responsible if he doesn't give you the ability to make a choice. What's responsible? How can you hold me accountable if I can't choose something? The reason why you are spanking me from a child is because I have the ability to choose right or wrong. Is it not? If, if, you are, if, 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 if God is the only one forcing me to choose wrong, why are you spanking me? Why don't you spank God? It's not my fault. No, because it's your fault. God will spank you. 
because you have rejected the truth. Number two, rejection of revealed truth makes it difficult to recognize and accept truth. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 8 through 10. Three, true knowledge without right application is useless. True knowledge without application is useless. Number four, it is not what you know about scripture that matters. It is what you do with what you know. It is not what you know about scripture that matters. It is what are you doing with what you know. Five, God's, approve, God's approval of man is not based on knowledge alone, but on application thereof. God's approval of man does not base on knowledge alone. You can know Genesis and Revelation, memorize them and know it all. That's, God will not say, wow. No, it's what your application of what you know. Finally, number six, God does not give man over until man gives God up. God does not, God does not, cannot, will not give you over or give you up until you first give God up. That is a fair God. That is a righteous God. That is the act of righteousness. God is righteous. God is loving. God is kind. We have just scratched the, the surface of uh, this uh, picture that Paul gave us regarding the people of Rome. We're gonna, one of the questions I ask is, what, where does homosexuality originate? What is all these things that is going and eating the world today? What does the Bible say about it? Next Sunday, God willing, we will continue to untangle this mess that we find among ourselves. The book of Romans is not your ordinary book. Great, a, great, a great man in the ancient time had the book read to him twice every week, the book of Romans. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, we bring our closing to anyone who is here without Christ, without hope, without eternal life. We want you to know that Jesus had you personally on his mind when he was hanging on the cross. Every sin that you have ever committed, past, present, and future, was judged on the cross. There was no sin that escaped the wrath of God on the cross of Calvary. He paid your penalty that by faith alone, in Christ alone, you will receive internal pardon, forgiveness of sin. That's what Paul, that's what Peter told Colinius and his household. In Acts 10, he says, of him, whoever believes receives forgiveness of sins. It's only faith. When they heard that, they believed, and the Holy Spirit came upon them, indicating that they have believed. It's only faith. They, didn't, they weren't even baptized before the Holy Spirit came upon them. They didn't raise their hands. They didn't even confess with their mouths. They were silent when the Holy Spirit came upon them. Peter was even surprised because they had not, they had not said anything. They haven't even asked me a question. All he saw, the Holy Spirit came upon them, indicating that God searches your heart. God knows your thoughts. God knows when you are real. God knows when you are fake. He knows everything. If he sees your heart right now that you have accepted this gift by faith alone, wholeheartedly, he will give you the same Holy Spirit he gave to those who accepted it, to all of us who have believed in Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, I'm going to call upon my brother David to close us in prayer. Almighty God and Father, we come before you at this, this time, Father, with thanksgiving for the 
message we have just received, Father, for your holy word that was taught here today, Father, the truth of your word. And this message, Father, and, and your plan must have been meant to be repeated that we may take heed, Father, of the, the sober nature, Father, and the reality of the evil in this world, Father. But we do know that your word is irrefutable, Father. We do know that you have given us this. Every word in it, Father, needs to be heeded. We know that. And I pray that each of us will take heed to the message that Reverend Moses gives every closing. The way to salvation through faith alone and Christ alone, Father. But I also pray that when we take that step, we take to heart every word in your Holy Scripture, Father, and that we put idols out of our life. Pray for the strength, for the understanding, but no, nothing, no one above you. And that we live our life, Father, as doers of your word, as we take in that each and every week. We pray for continued growth, continue understanding, Father. And we pray that if it be your will, that you would assemble us again here next week in this room, along with our brothers and sisters throughout the world. Father, we pray for your protection and safety during this week. We ask these things by the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ.